Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to evening prayer. Well, we didn't only manage to get half the car fixed. There was uh, a little too much horsing around and too much distraction, so. But luckily we got done a lot quicker. We got what we did done quicker than if I hadn't have been there because my brother doesn't remember how to work on German cars. And so it was a blessing to be there and be able to help. And it was a good thing because there were some issues. But, um, uh, We'll get it finished next Sunday. Consequences of my actions are evident. <laughs> I'm sitting here slowly growing more and more in pain for uh, exerting myself that way. And uh, it's okay. It was worth it. Because it actually is going to be a benefit to several people to do what I did. Uh, na namely, a little four-year-old nephew that I care about. So... It's all worth it. But on that subject, you know, we go through a lot of hardships in life. Um, we're going to read some scriptures on this. It can be pain. It can be sickness. Um, my mother-in-law is sick right now. She felt so bad yesterday, and she told my wife, all I need is a couple of syringes of morphine, and it'll all be over. And my wife was giving her a bunch of grief about it. And I was like, you know, I understand where she's coming from. I've been there. When you're hurting all the time and there's no escape from it. And you just feel terrible all the time and it never ends. And you're in pain all the time and it never ends. That's how you feel. You just want it to end and go on, go on to the next one. You're ready for it to be over with. But in those moments when we do agree with those things, in those moments when we understand what people are going through. That's why Dr. Kevorkian was so popular. There were a lot of people, they were tired of suffering. Nothing helped them. Those are the moments when we need to take the step back and look to the Lord. Those are the moments when we think we can't go any further, when we just can't handle it. That's when we need to go to the Lord. And many occasions, even I didn't turn to him when those problems came. But that's what we're supposed to do. Because the only answer to those situations is with him. Now, some of the stuff we're going to read in here is going to, going to completely, you know, uh, confirm a bunch of things that I've told you guys before. But, you know, when those problems are coming, when those things are hard, the best thing to do is to turn to him. You know, if you know you can't fix it or deal with it, you take it to him, lay it at his feet and walk away. Lord, I can't do this. I'm not good enough and I'm not strong enough. Certainly not smart enough. So you leave it in his capable hands and let him deal with it. But what do we get out of going through those things? Strength, faith, peace. We're being prepared for something better. And many of those things become blessings to us when we're on the other side. So today we're on Bible Reasons and it's 25 encouraging verses about hardship. When your life is all about Christ, hardships are inevitable. The Bible tells us that very clearly. There are many reasons, and the funny is that you will see a lot of Christians say, oh, if you've got the Holy Spirit, your life should be great. Not so. It's completely the opposite of what the Bible says. There are many reasons why Christians go through hardships in life. Sometimes it is to discipline us and bring us back on the path of righteousness. Sometimes it's to strengthen our faith and make us more like Christ. Sometimes we have to go through hardships to get to a blessing. Tough times prove ourselves to God and they build our relationship with him. It might seem hard, but remember, God is on your side. If God is for us, who can be against us? Regardless of the reasons you are going through adversity, be strong and patient because the Lord will help you. Think about Jesus who suffered severe hardship. God will hold you up with his mighty hand. God is doing something in your life Suffering is not meaningless. I've told you guys over and over, and the Bible proves this because there's very clear scripture on this, that the suffering we go through is meant for a purpose. And there is something that's going to come out of it that's good. He hasn't forsaken you. Instead of doubting, start praying. Ask God for strength, encouragement, comfort, and help. Wrestle with the Lord day in and day out. Show bravery, remain steadfast in the Lord, and may you store these scripture quotes in your heart. These are quotes from people. Faith endures as seeing him who is invisible. 
endures the disappointments, the hardships, and the heartaches of life by recognizing that all comes from the hand of him who is too wise to err and too loving to be unkind. That's from A.W. Pink. He who knows no hardships will know no hardihood. He who faces no calamity will need no courage. Mysterious though it is, the characteristics in human nature which we love best grow in a soil with a strong mixture of troubles. That's Harry Emerson Fostick. And he's right. How, how do you ever know what you can endure until you endure? I, I met tons of people in the army, thought they were tough. I'm tough, I'm this, I'm that. I knew one guy that was a level four, level four combatives uh, qualified. In perfect shape, perfect PT score. Didn't even make it 30 days in Iraq. We think we're something. But when the things get hard, then we find out what we really are. We find out where we really stand and what we're really made of. I've witnessed a lot of people get shown all too clearly what they really were when they got out in the theater and had to endure being attacked. When life and death became real for them, then they couldn't take it. We never know until we go through, through something hard. And when we go through it and get to the other side, we are better for it. The victory is always ours. When something bad happens, you have three choices. You can let it define you, let it destroy you, or you can let it strengthen you. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. And that's from C.S. Lewis. I like the last one. That's pretty good. And, and that's what we go through, the things that we're enduring now. That's something, and it's part of the reason why I've been warning everybody here the last few days, and I'm going to keep putting this warning out. Don't, don't, don't be surprised. You need to expect, settle it in your heart, that any morning you're going to wake up and everything in your world is going to be changed. Everything. You will not recognize what has happened. It'll, it, it'll be that quick. And that's from, that's from that day that I said that a couple of days ago forward from now on. Because we don't know. We don't know what's in our future, except for what the Bible tells us. What man is going to do, we just don't know. And we could go through some things. It could happen. Will we go through the tribulation? Nope, absolutely not. But things could get a lot rougher before the tribulation. What we want to do is we want to stand strong and be hardy people. We want to be there and be a rock for those who do fall and can't endure because that's a perfect mission field to get people saved but if we collapse under pressure how can we expect to lead anybody else through those same problems in 2 Corinthians 6 3 through 5 we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry and everything we do we show that we are true ministers of God we patiently endure troubles come on stop and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. Can anybody relate to those things at all? Yeah, I certainly can. Most of my life. <laughs> Second Timothy 4, 5. You, however, be self-controlled in all things. Endure hardship. That's some of the, one of the key ways to learn to be self-controlled is enduring hardship. Endure hardship. Do an evangelist work. Fulfill your ministry. People wonder sometimes, and I used to wonder this too until I realized what was going on, why I couldn't get a sin conquered. Why can't I conquer this sin? Why can't I have victory? Why can't I get out of it? It's because he's teaching us to be stronger. So that at a future time we can fight that sin. He's teaching us to recognize what's causing the temptation so that we re realize what that is and remove it thereby making it easier to fight the actual sin. It doesn't make sense. Well, if I'm saved, why is he allowing me to keep doing this? Why does he give me the strength to overcome this? Why doesn't he take this away from me? Because he's trying to teach you something. He's trying to teach you to be stronger and to endure. It's hard. Paul talked about it. I prayed three times. He said, nope, my grace is sufficient. You'll be fine. Paul still had to endure with that. Now, we don't know what that was. It could have been some sins. It could have been some... Some health issues, we don't know. But clearly, most of the 
apostles had issues that they had to endure. I'm sure Peter remembered for the rest of his life what he said to the Lord. I'll never abandon you. And then three times he abandoned him, even after the Lord told him he was going to do it. I'm sure he lived with that memory for the rest of his life. I'm sure it tore him up inside. But he learned to overcome. He learned to endure. All our past sins, we don't forget them. We just learn that they don't apply anymore because they have, the debt's been paid. All of our problems and our inconsistencies and the things that we have that are wrong with us, we learn that is no more a, a, has no more bearing on us anymore because we know God has accepted us regardless of those things. We don't let that stuff get us down because now we know how the salvation works. And it's not based on our performance. A lot of people want that they're desperately trying to be perfect and not realizing it was never meant for us to be perfect. He will make us perfect. 2 Timothy 1, 7, 8, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And that applies to every one of us. You know, a lot of times we don't do a certain ministry or we don't talk to somebody uh, in a public setting because we're afraid of the ramifications. That's a perfect situation to do it. All the more. A lot of people give uh, Ray Comfort all kinds of grief. How many people go out there in California, no less, and do what he does? Not very many. I got to give that man a lot of credit. He's willing to go out there and risk... What's stopping someone from running up and just shooting him in the face? Nothing. Yet he's out there. And he knows that. He's admitted that. He goes, I know that the possibility is there. And he, he says, I'm, I'm quite sure one day it's probably going to happen. But, but he's out there doing it. In a lot of cases, we don't. That's those times when we should join in and we should help with those things. Romans 8, 35, 39, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? No, nope. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? This ought to be good. Are Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. This is the answer. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I'm going to read that again. Romans 8, 35, 39. I got to start again. because We're not done with it yet, but I start again. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? See, this is what people tell us nowadays. Well, if you're suffering, he, he, you don't have God's love. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth beneath, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Powerful. So, other people are going to tell you, well, since you're going through these things, since you're sick and you're not perfectly healed, you don't have the Holy Spirit. I fought with a bunch of these people last year. Well, if you get the Holy Spirit, you're perfectly healed and everything's good. No, I'm not Wolverine. I don't have an instant heal process contained within my body. I'm not an X-Men. In fact, chances are, after you get saved, it'll get worse for you. But that's training. It's training us for eternity. How are you going to know how to walk and how to act when you get to heaven if you don't learn here? We're being prepared for heaven. This is all preparation because when we get up there, it's going to be a snap and a piece of cake. And we'll always wonder why we it, 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 things things bothered us. We'll wonder why we struggled. Because afterwards we'll look back and go, why did I even doubt? 
John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. See, no matter what we go through, regardless of anything we see and endure and partake in, we still belong to Jesus Christ and he is still coming for us. Nothing changes that. 2 Corinthians 12.10, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For then I am weak. For when I am weak, then I am strong. These things that we go through, these things that we endure, make us weaker. But we're, we're stronger because of those things. Romans 12, 11, 12, do not lack diligence. Be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer. James 1, 2, 4, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I can attest to this scripture perfectly because I'm seeing this happen within myself. I didn't know what it was at first until I went into prayer. I'm seeing this happen within myself. Am I perfect at it? No, <laughs> but I'm growing that direction and I love it. I'm getting stronger to endure the things that I am enduring. Now people look at me and they see me getting weaker. I'm not getting weaker. I'm actually getting stronger. Because now everything that I view is changing. Everything that I do is changing. And I'm seeing the after effects of it transfer over to the people around me. Because they're getting a sense of this strength. And it's having a positive effect on them. How we deal with these things shows other people how Christians are. Especially if they know we're Christian. But how we deal with it can also affect how they deal with problems in their life. 1 Peter 5, 9, 10, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that, the, that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering. You are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. This little bit of life we have here, to us, seems like an eternity. But in the grand scheme of everything, it's nothing. It's like I said, when we get there and we turn around and look back, we're going to wonder why we ever doubted. We're going to wonder why we ever questioned. We're going to wonder why we ever stumbled and staggered. And we'll ask ourselves that, I'm sure. Why did I ever doubt? Because at that point, everything will change. Well, if we can establish that understanding here in this form, think of what will be in the next form. Exodus 33, 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Amen. Deuteronomy 31, 8, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Now, does that mean you were wrong for being discouraged? Well, no. Jeremiah had an entire ministry and life of being discouraged, and he, he's one of the chosen of God. So, no, it, it, being discouraged is normal. What they, what they don't want you to do is they don't want you to get to the point where you abandon your faith. They don't want you to get shipwrecked. Sometimes you're going to go through stuff that's going to beat you down to the ground. You know what you do when that happens? Start counting rocks. Examine the dirt. Sing psalms. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to him. Lift up his holy name. What do you think will happen when people see you beaten down to the dirt and you sing out praises to the Lord? It changes people, especially when those people are just as just as messed up and, and beaten and, and broken as you are. Your strength in the Lord will give them strength. Psalm 34, 17, 19, the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. Now, again, it may not be what we think it should be, 
but he's always there and he will never leave us. I can attest to this too from personal experience. Psalm 37, 23, 25, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young and now am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Psalm 91, 9, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is my refuge. Psalm 9, 9 through 10, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Hebrews 12, 5, 8, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that it addresses you as a father addresses his son? Let me say that again. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. If you are going through things, if you are receiving chastisement, it's because you are in the grace of God. That seems like a weird concept, but he disciplines his children. That means you are a son. If you're not receiving discipline, there's a problem. Like, like uh, Diamond Districation says, if you're not receiving chastisement, then ye are bastards. You, ye are not in the, the family. We are a family. We are a group of people that are under the blanket of sonhood under the umbrella of our Father in Heaven. That is why we go through what we go through. We don't fully understand it, but when you start to, it changes your view on these things. You learn to receive these things with open arms and gladness. Thank you, Father, for chastising me and correcting me and correcting my way. I know that you do this because you love me and don't want me to go any further the direction I'm going. You want me to stay on the path and stay where you want me to be. He doesn't do that to everyone. Those that are in rebellion run from it. Christians run from it. It's a terrible thing. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So all these people that are out there talking about, well, if you've got all these problems in your life, and all, oh no, you're, you're not saved. You still got to get the Holy Spirit. Well, then why aren't you reading your scriptures? To those people that say that, why aren't you reading your scriptures? Because clearly we are going to go through those things. There is no child that walks the line. Every child has to endure being uh, receiving punishment for the things they do wrong. They need to get correction. Every child, there is no child that doesn't is excluded from this. I'm sure whenever they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem to, to get Jesus, when he was hanging out with the physicians, I'm sure he got his butt chewed on all the way back to Bethlehem. And back then it was on, they were walking at, at mule speed. So, you know, it was a while. He probably took it, took a butt chewing all the way there. Everybody who is in the body of Christ is going to receive chastisement. If you're not, I would be very worried. If you're not going through troubles in your life, I would be worried. I would question where I stand with the Lord because you should be going through those things. Clearly, we see this being very vividly explained in Hebrews 12, clearly. Psalm 31, 23, 24, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, wait patiently for the Lord, be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. That's for today, for the rapture that's coming. So many people are getting impatient, but I'm starting to see a shift. Those who are the Lord's are starting to step back and go, I'm not going to get caught up in all this hoopla anymore, all this stuff going on with this day setting. I'm going to do the actual watching where I'm going to wait and prayerfully watch for the Lord like I'm supposed to. 
And that's a good thing because so much more peace falls on your life when you do that. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Matthew 10, and all nations will hate you because you are my followers, but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything, causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Can you get attacked and be have an onslaught of issues running through the gauntlet from Satan and demons? Absolutely. What's God going to do? Is he going to jerk you out of that? No. He's going to be there with you while you go through it. And what he's going to do is he's going to take that, and even though it was meant by evil for them, he's going to turn it to, into something good for you because what you suffer through turns into reward in heaven. And he will take that and flip it for your benefit and for his glory. So the things that we go through, we glorify God for the things that we go through because no matter what it is or where it comes from, it's for our betterment. It is going to be better for us. And when we get to the other side, we're going to see the, the profit that comes from that kind of development. See, in our world, to us, all those things are bad. We've always been taught that those things are bad and we should avoid them. But from the scriptures, the understanding is don't avoid them. Revel in them. Grow in them. Walk right through the fire. Because when you do, and we have examples all over the Bible of this, because when you do, the Lord will deliver you. He will see your strength and your faith, and he will make it more. And the blessing will come upon you like never before. 2 Corinthians 4, 8-9, through 9, We have troubles all around us, but we are not defeated. We do not know what to do, but we do not give up the hope of living. We are persecuted, but God does not leave us. We are hurt sometimes, but we are not destroyed. I love the first one. We are not defeated. And the second one's good too. We do not know what to do, but we don't give up. When you're lost, that's when you're even more found. When you feel like he is nowhere near you, that's when he's closest to you. Ephesians 6, 13, 14, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And I'm actually going to go back into that one. Uh, we're going we're gonna to use that in the prayer. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. 1 Peter 5, 7, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet and he will deal with it. And here's the bonus one, Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him, for the, for the joy set before him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me, let me put that in a, in a better way to say it. Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy that was set before him. That's what that means, is he endured those things because of the joy that was being presented to him. If he did it, shouldn't we? Absolutely. We, we're not called to do it perfectly. We're just called to stand. And he will come to us and he will deliver us. Now, let's run over here. Get that out of the way. Get that out of the way. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Boom. All right, let's get into some prayer now, and we're going to pray this armor. And this is armor that we need to live. Lord, we come before you this evening to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to give thanks to you, to praise your name, and to lift you up as our Lord and Savior. We want to give thanks for your word. We want to give thanks for it strengthening us spiritually. The flesh is weak. The flesh is broken. The flesh is going to break down. I'm in so much pain right now, I can't even sit up. I desperately am ready to go to bed and lay down and get off my back for a while, but just breathing hurts because it stretches the muscles in my back. But the Spirit is on fire. You've set me on fire for these prayers. I consider not doing evening prayer tonight. You said, nope. You're going to do it anyway. Okay? 
And here we are. And you have strengthened me to do this. I was, I was leaning over the computer earlier, barely able to sit up at the computer chair. Lord, you have poured out your spirit on us in these last days. You have taken the people and awakened them. And I'm starting to see more and more other individual people some that are high up in, in Christendom that are very well known and some that aren't, but they're all starting to see the same thing. We're all starting to get on the same page. And there's a clear division between those that are on the same page and those that aren't. There's a clear division about who actually are, belongs to you and who doesn't. Who really believes and really, really loves and is waiting for you. Who is walking as close to perfection as they can trying to change, trying to be better, trying to live out the life you have picked for them and those that aren't, those that are living for themselves and for the world. There's a very clear line between each. And a lot of people are starting to see it. I watched a video today, great video, from Tom Horn. He mentioned some things about that in there. There's a lot of people that are seeing these things and it's starting to make them step back and pause because now they're starting to realize the Lord really is coming back. A lot of people who are, are in question about it before are questioning it now. They know this is the time. And they're seeing it clearer than it ever was before because you're sending out so many warnings. You're calling up your people in every corner of the world and in every form of ministry to sound the alarm and to call out warnings. We are watchmen. That's funny because in my head, I literally just went, we are watchmen. Bump, 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 bump. We are watchmen. We are watching for you. We are watching for that day. We are watching for what's coming. And we are supposed to sound the alarm when we see trouble coming. And that's why I have been telling people, to be ready. You may wake up one morning and everything's changed. That's because it's coming. There's no doubt it's coming. You've been giving us warnings to share with people about our walks. There is a calling for Christians to walk in a way that is obedient to your commandments that you gave. Not the Ten Commandments, the commands you gave on how we should walk. Things we should avoid, what we should do. The Ten Commandments are something separate. And people don't want to do that because they're spending so much time fighting against all this other stuff. They're missing the whole goal of all of this. And that's to be in a relationship with you. That's to be connected to you very intimately and specifically. And it's so easy. But it requires something from us. And that is for us to take what we think we know and lay it down. And walk away from it. It's to take our pride and cast it away is to take what we think is right and wrong and kick it to the curb and get into your word, stay in your word and learn what your will is for us. And I'm finding more and more people putting out videos that are saying the same thing from all walks of life and all walks of, of Christianity saying, you got to get into the word, people. you got to get back into the word. We can't ignore this anymore. You must be in the scriptures yourselves. I, and I heard a guy today, very famous evangelist. He says, I can tell you whatever I want. He goes, and, and the majority of people are going to believe it and the rest are going to fall in because they want to be like everybody else. He goes, I know this. I've seen it happen. I used to be one. He goes, but that's not the right way to do it. He said, I, I have received revelation that every one of us needs to be in the word. You can't go to church and use the excuse, well, that's what pastor said. He goes, you can't do that. Read your word. He says, I gave up my pastorship because of that. Because it, it, the ministry isn't in that church building on Sundays. The ministry is in your heart. The ministry is between you and him. That's your church. He says, it's you, not the building. He goes, because when everybody leaves the building, it's just a building. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in that building. The Holy Spirit lives in you. This is so you go to the Word and learn about Him. And I love listening to him talk about that because he was very insistent. He says, you can't let people tell you what the Bible means. It's, it's not where I got it from, but it was awesome to hear him say that. 
You can't let people tell you what the Bible means. He said, you must go read it for yourself. And he was very adamant about that. I agree completely. It's not good enough to listen and let someone else tell you. It's not good enough. Our relationship with him is specific between, my relationship with Christ is between me and Christ and no one else. Your relationship with Christ is between you and Christ and no one else. Each one of us has a very specific, intimate relationship. But if you never develop it, if you never read the word, how are you ever going to have that? Lord, you showed that to me last year, and I've been telling people about it ever since. Lord, you show that to each one of us. But most people don't get it. Our world has taught us to let it be someone else's responsibility. Our world has taken away individual responsibility, accountability, and integrity. And those are the key things we need back. So Lord, I pray you put it on our hearts for those things because we are in battle right now. That's why I'm in Ephesians 6. We are in battle right now. We are fighting this fight, and we need to live this armor. You taught me that. Live the, live the armor. Don't still pray the armor. Live the armor. Finally, brethren, Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not our strength, his strength. In his authority, we have power. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan doesn't take a break, so we have to keep that armor on all the time. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Lord, at this time, in supplication and by intercession, I give thanks for all the brethren for what you're doing in our lives and for the word you have given us, for the revelation you are pouring out on us this day, for how you've opened up the scriptures to speak to us clearly into our individual lives, to the problems we have, to the sins we have, to the things we deal with every day and how to overcome them. You have clear, very clearly clarified the window we look through. That's around your word. Lord, I lift people up today. Sister Jennifer, for breathing, congestion, and muscle spasms. She really, really wants a feel-great day. And Lord, you know what she's talking about because you've given it to her before. Lord, lay into her with both healing hands. Stretch her out on your spiritual gurney and do surgery. And give her a, a brand new look on things, a new understanding on things, a new strength that overcomes her physical ailments, and at the same time, show her what those things are meant to show her and meant to do in her. Show her what those, those issues, those health issues are meant to accomplish so that she understands what she's going through and the direction it's taking her. Because when you did that to me, it helped me walk even more in that direction. Uh, IRS Shill, he at lifts up the, our Armenian Christian brothers and sisters who are being martyred right now. There's a huge fight going on in Armenia and a couple other places, and there's a lot of killing going on. They are killing Christians wholesale. We've had just a, suddenly a surge of Christians being killed here in America. Lord, be with our brothers and sisters and give them strength to make it through to the end. We know that it's destined for some people to be martyred. Not everybody, but some. That's what they're... And the result is that they will be martyred. You've picked them specifically for that. We pray you give them strength to endure that to the very end. And pray that they are triumphant in their overcoming these things. And Steve, he's praying for the salvation of all that are unsaved. Lord, we pray that the seeds we plant will grow in the tribulation. We pray that, that no matter what, that we have opportunities to be able to even just plant a seed. 
or maybe water a seed or cultivate or harvest a, a, a crop from somebody else's seed planting, but to get people saved because they need to be saved. At this time, Lord, I lift up all the brothers and sisters around the world who have unspoken prayer requests. Lift them up to your throne. All the brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted, and there are many in this, every country, for strength and edification and deliverance, be it martyrdom or be it, you know, rescue, either one, but that they're, they're taken out of this, but to give them strength through it. We know we have to go through some things. We're living in some place we don't belong. Here in America, same thing. Give us strength to endure through it because we know what's coming. You warned us about it. We know what to expect and what's going to happen. You warned us about it. I, I pray you prepare us diligently and help us settle it in our hearts to be ready for anything that shows up, no matter what it is. And if nothing happens, great. But if something does, we're ready for it. That's the armor. Teach us to live the armor every day. Satan never takes a break. He never sleeps. We can't either. We have to have that armor every, every day. And the only way to wear it every day is to live it every day. Help us do that, Lord. Help us accomplish that. So that we will be ready. So that we will walk in integrity and in truth and in faith and in your grace. And that the whole time we will show love and compassion to everyone, even our tormentors. Because that's what you did. Should we do any different? Or we love you and we thank you. We praise you. We sing your praises to the world. Talk of your great works to the world this morning. Everything that was done on the cross. I will, I will sing that out everywhere I can. So people know more about what that means and how much more important it is than what the world has taught. Well, I pray you, you build us up spiritually in these last days. Make us ready. Teach us. Train us. Show us what this means. Help us to put this into our hearts so that we remember it always. And we live these precepts you've given. We thank you, Lord, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for evening prayer. With the way things are nowadays and what's going on around the world, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen every day. That's why I've been saying what I've been saying. Be ready. Be prepared. You don't need to run out to the store and buy a ton of stuff. You don't need to, to, to prep and prepare to, to live in uh, World War III with zombies running around. It's completely irrelevant. Instead, prepare your hearts. Prepare spiritually. Be ready for those things. Prepare your family and friends. Prepare the people around you. They're not going to listen. They're not going to accept it. But if you plant seeds in the fires of tribulation, those seeds will grow. Because after every fire, everything turns green immediately. Seeds germinate in fire. And then they sprout and grow. You have never seen greener grass than at, right after a forest fire. So don't waste opportunities. Don't miss those chances. You know, if somebody shut the door, fine. The door shut. Go to someone else. Go through someone else to get to them. I've used that tactic quite a few times. It's not too late to reach somebody that you think isn't going to be reached. It's not too late to set the example. you got to use discernment and look and see what will work. Sometimes just them seeing you and what you do is enough. Sometimes it's you have to take a direct approach. And whatever you do, trust the Lord. Trust in what He's doing. In your life and in the lives of people around you. Trust in His Word. I've shared some great stuff today on the Community tab. Trust in His Word. Always trust in His Word. Because we don't know what the future is going to bring. We know in a general sense, but we don't know specifically what's going to happen next week. What's going to happen in three days? What's going to happen Monday morning when we wake up? We don't know. 
the whole world could be different. So this is why we prepare now. This is why we're ready now. This is why no one knows when the rapture is going to happen and no one's ever going to know. Because he wants us to live that way every minute of every day. Always ready, always prepared, always watching. I talked to somebody that was in their 80s uh, here beginning of the year. And they said, I was saved in 1974. I've been watching since then. I understood right away the concept of watching. He said, I've been watching for, what they say, 60 years? And this lady said, I don't regret a single day of it. She said, I, I knew back then it probably wasn't close, but she goes, she goes as time has gone on, I, I see it. And she said, take it from somebody who spent their whole life watching for this. This is it. We've never had this before. We're seeing this now. You can bet your dog, bottom dollar, this is it. So, if somebody who's been watching most of their life can say that, what should we be doing? Watching. And settling these things in our hearts. That It's going to be this way. There's nothing we can do about it. We can't change it. So why worry about it and why get scared? If we've already got the victory through Christ, what are we scared of? Nothing. All right, guys. I love y'all. Study these things. Look these things up. Don't, don't believe me and take my word for it. Look at it for yourself because Christ gave all these warnings and all these bits of advice in the word. And this is the time to watch out for those things and be ready. Because you never know. When things fall apart, you may be the one everybody runs to for guidance. And if you're not prepared, how are you going to do it? The Lord will use you. Love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I pray you have a beautiful evening. And I will see you guys in the next video.